This is the second segment of architecture in the 19th century. This is a 19th century view of King's Cross Railway Station. This was built in 1851 by Thomas Cubitt. It was an example of a new building type, the railway station terminus. Cubitt wasn't an architect, but in a way like so, his response to this new building type was to create a new kind of architecture. One that came from a response to the pragmatic and practical nature and needs of this new type of building. There are no conventional classical ornaments. There is no arcade of columns of any and no recognisable classical order going on. There are arches, but these are uh, technological responses to uh, the needs of span using brick masonry. The expressive elements that we do see are uh, dominating. We have the two very large arches filled with glass, which reveal uh, and, and actually show to the passing public the glass uh, roofs of the sheds behind. Uh, along which the, the platforms lie, and, and this is where the rail, uh, railway engines arrive from elsewhere in the country. These giant arches reveal the sheer scale of the space behind. At, at the bottom in the foreground, we can see that there are other arches, and these are much smaller in scale. There are three of these compared to the one single one behind. These show a change in scale. So while the, the great arches are about the scale of the shed behind, the smaller arches in the foreground are more related to the people who are going to access the spaces. So there, there is a kind of a transition between the, the scale of infrastructure and the scale of pedestrians. The giant piers on each side of the big arches are there partly as structural stability and the central one has a kind of a slightly whimsical looking top on it which looks a little bit perhaps like some kind of uh, Italian country church but has again a true and uh, relevant symbolic purpose which is the clock and this is the other great innovation of railways which required the introduction of standard time across the country so that railways could run to a timetable. So King's Cross is another way in which uh, engineering ideas allow architecture to break away from the traditions of the past and create something fresh and new. This is the inside of the station. Uh, we can see the uh, uh, combination of brick masonry and cast iron um, roof structure, all topped with glass so that plenty of light can come through. And we can see that giant glass arch with the three smaller arches at the base at the far end. Symbolically, we have two sheds here, one for arrivals and one for departures. So although this building could be seen as a simply engineered, a, a pragmatic response to a need, so a sort of a, just a, a piece of machinery, there, there is symbolism going on. There is thought going on about how people will feel, about how people will react to this new experience. This is architecture. This drawing shows Another uh, astonishing achievement from the same year, 1851. This is a view of the Crystal Palace. Now, this was a building that was constructed to house an exhibition, the uh, exhibition of works of all nations, as it was called. This was built in Hyde Park. And 
what was astonishing about this building, other than it being p p the largest covered space in the world at the time, it, I think it covered the equivalent of about three football pitches and was big enough to be built around two or three fully grown trees, was that its use of new manufacturing techniques meant that this whole building was assembled uh, from really a handful of identical components using cast iron, glass and some elements of raw iron. And it meant that the whole thing was built in a few months. So again, a, an incredible architectural achievement, but based on engineering principles. With engineering achievements such as these, it would be thought that together with Soane's uh, aesthetic innovations, that a completely new kind of architecture would take hold. But in the event, this didn't happen. What we're looking at here are a couple of pages from a book written by Augustus Pugin. Pugin was a very religious person and his whole uh, worldview was that the classical revival was deeply wrong. He didn't believe it was wrong because that the that, that classical world didn't properly reflect the, uh, the modern industrial age, but rather, rather the reverse, that classical architecture was from a, a pagan past and that the, the true and natural architecture for a country like England, uh, being a, a Christian tradition, should be that that was abandoned during the Renaissance, i.e. Gothic. In the images that we see, the Q, Pu, Pugin is contrasting the, the modern contemporary city above with its uh, neoclassical churches built like temples and its uh, factories and smokestacks. He's comparing this unfavourably with the medieval world below, with its Gothic architecture, uh, it, it's more uh, open and leafy, more naturalistic surroundings. And Pugin is suggesting that the Gothic world, if it could only be recreated, would be a much better place to live. In the world of architecture, this book set off a furious argument about which of the two styles, Gothic or classical, should be the correct one. What we can see here uh, behind Westminster Bridge are the Houses of Parliament. These are Pugin and Barry's uh, Gothic masterpiece. The old Houses of Parliament were burned down in a, a catastrophic fire in 1830. And uh, there were competitions and endless arguments about how the new building should be replaced. In the event, Pugin's Gothic uh, won the competition. So here we can see the, the famous clock tower with the Big Ben bell inside it. Uh, so this is a uh, 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 second half of the 19th century, this building, and yet it's in the architectural style last seen uh, in the Henry VII chapel across the road from the, the very beginning of the 16th century. So this is the, the response to pagan classicism, to revive uh, a style which had effectively been discontinued some sort of 300 years before. This look uh, at the Houses of Parliament across the river, at a glance we can see, oh yes, this is a Gothic building. There are sharp points, pinnacles, uh, all of the kind of trappings of the perpendicular with the plentiful vertical ribs and so on. But a slightly closer look, it, it starts to look slightly different in, in a way this is this as gothic as it appears because there's elements strong elements of symmetry about this we can see at either end of the main range there are a pair of towers 
uh, and then towards the middle there are two more towers further spaced apart and everything along this frontage is highly symmetrically arranged and it's only the the bigger towers in the background that that change this looking at a plan of the building we can see an arrangement which is strongly symmetrical very ordered uh, indeed uh, rational so not very gothic after all and in fact the only elements on this plan uh, which are truly gothic and date back from medieval times are those uh, areas of the plan in grey up at the top which include the giant Westminster Hall. So the 19th century became a kind of battleground of competing architectural styles with uh, classical on the one hand and Gothic on the other. Here we can see Leeds Town Hall from 1853 in a kind of neo-Baroque style. And this by contrast is the slightly later Manchester Town Hall, which exhibits a kind of neo-French Gothic. In a way, the irony of these buildings is that while they uh, sort of copy styles from the distant past, the materials and the technologies that are inside them are hugely innovative and uh, show a level of technology that uh, simply didn't exist uh, when their originals were built. Both Leeds Town Hall and Manchester Town Hall uh, have complicated and very sophisticated ventilation systems. Um, it, on the walls of the Manchester Town Hall that we can see here, there are glazed tiles which are there so that the space can be more easily cleaned despite the uh, elaborate decoration uh, all over the surface. Again, the roof uh, is, is covered with glass in sheets that were simply not available in the Middle Ages. Only the uh, uh, decorative stained glass in the far end uh, shows something more like a, a medieval technique. This disconnect between engineering and architecture led to some, some true oddities. This is the uh, St Pancras train shed from 1863 by William Barlow. At the time, the largest single span uh, anywhere in the world. Roofed over with glass, uh, it uses a combination of cast and wrought iron uh, to, to create that framework. And Originally, uh, all uh, uh, incoming and outgoing train services ha uh, happened be below this single span. And yet, from the front, uh, in contrast to next door King's Cross, there is no hint of this technological marvel because it's completely hidden by this neo-Gothic hotel that completely covers the incredible train shed behind. And in domestic uh, environments, this lack of clarity kind of breaks out as well. So the, the Georgian unity of, of houses looking similar was replaced by a kind of restless urge for, uh, for difference, for individuality. Uh, so that all of the houses started to get funny little projections and gables and uh, little details to separate them from each other none of which really worked in terms of making the houses look different, but, but rather just made the whole environment seem fussy and overcomplicated. Eventually, architects and designers began to think that there should be perhaps a more appropriate style, one more related to the age, rather than simply trying to copy versions of the past. And this, William Morris's Red House, by the architect Philip Webb is um, an early attempt to, to try and achieve this. At first glance, this looks a, 
like a gothic house with we've got some pointed arch windows and so on but it's lacking the kind of details that are typical for a neo-gothic creation it's it's rather stripped down uh, so there is an attempt here to do something that is that is novel that is fresh inside again it is reminiscent of a kind of medieval environment uh, there is exposed timber framing there's plenty of wood there's some carving going on but again there is no attempt to copy uh, historic models and this is rather a kind of recreation of some of the principles of uh, perhaps vernacular architecture so an architecture that is not based on historic precedent and in the process creates something rather new. This uh, style of architecture became known as arts and crafts. Another example of this is Brockhampton Church by William Letherby. Again at first glance we see something that looks like a medieval church but a, a slightly closer ex uh, sort of view shows that it, it isn't actually using any of the accepted uh, precedents. The uh, pointed arch at that doorway uh, is a little bit awkward. It's quite flat-sided. The, uh, the, the sort of tower base that it's on is very square and there is very little ornamentation around the doorway itself. And then the window, there's that big square window in the pointed gable. Um, these are not conventional Gothic, Gothic forms. They are kind of abstractions of them. So they're suggestive, but, but not. These are attempts to become a, a, a novel solution, a novel aesthetic. Inside the church, that uh, pointed arch theme again is still there. But what we can see, those arches are, uh, they're a kind of a hybrid because the roof itself is concrete um, and the, the stonework is kind of a cladding to that. So these arches are, are more kind of an expression, an evocation of space rather than a, a, a sort of a, a true recreation of the Gothic original. So again, something new is being created. It looks superficially reminiscent of the past, but it isn't. This kind of use of elements that are reminiscent of the past uh, was used again here at Standen House. What we can see here is it's almost a kind of a collage of historic and traditional motifs. So things like those uh, uh, repeated gables uh, we see these on uh, houses from the Middle Ages, but the windows below are from other periods, perhaps Queen Anne. So because this is a, um, a, a non-historical, it's not a, a true historic revival, again, using a process of collage, the, the architect is trying to do something novel, something different. The, the quality of this difference is more apparent from the other side of the house. The great sweep of that huge roof with the big chimneys, uh, there's very little kind of architectural detail around this. It kind of stops. The arch below it is suppressed. Uh, and what we see instead, we begin to see just pure shapes, pure form that really aren't anything to do with any kind of story about Gothic construction or classical uh, orders. Voisey was one of the most successful of these uh, uh, arts and crafts architects. Um, and this is a, a, a design for a house near Guildford in Surrey. And uh, as with the others, we can see quite a strong kind of evocation it's kind of reminiscent of a, a medieval or or rustic uh, vernacular house but the overall effect is rather different and is much more stripped down is quite abstract 
and the emphasis is very much on the form. What we see is the very long, uh, pure shape of that huge roof. And this is emphasised by the use of those uh, tiny little mullion windows organised into very strong horizontals. And that kind of horizontal striping and the very uh, uh, elemental modelling form of this building is starting to kind of prefigure some of the preoccupations of modern architecture later on. This is Royce's only non-domestic piece of work, a uh, warehouse for uh, Liberty in central London, and again shows a complete break with past models. This suddenly doesn't look anything like a classical or even a vernacular tradition. I'm not sure quite how successful it is as a piece of architecture, but it's definitely novel. Elsewhere in Britain, Charles Rennie Mackintosh uh, was working in Glasgow. This is his Hill House uh, from late in the 19th century. And this kind of tendency towards a stripping away of detail so that the, the primary elements of form are more visible is even more apparent here. The use of flat white render uh, provides that emphasis and there's very little in the way of, of detailing in terms of window heads or sills. This is Macintosh's uh, School of Art in central Glasgow and again uh, there's a stripping away of some elements of detail. This is a kind of, there is a kind of an expressive quality to this. Uh, if we look at the upper windows we can see those decorative pieces of wrought iron, which are decorative, but actually serve a, a practical purpose in that these giant windows would need cleaning with ladders. And those uh, bits of raw iron work are places for the ladders to be lent up against without damaging the glass. At the rear of the School of Art, the uh, uh, concentration on form and move away from uh, decorative detail is even more apparent. The sides are stone, uh, very little detail, they are just very simply modelled surfaces. The small panes of glass serve to break up the window and make it read as a single uh, object, whereas on this side the use of render makes us look uh, this is really is a piece of abstract sculpture rather than a building almost. Inside this kind of abstract quality is even more strong. What we can see are a, a system of vertical supports and horizontal beams which clearly are there to hold up floors and ceilings and so on but create a kind of an abstract pattern all by themselves. So this is a, a the beginnings of a true new style which doesn't bear any debt or any relationship to the past and is, is truly creating something novel, but something generated from uh, the, the combination of structure, material and space. In North America, the uh, arts and crafts style was also a, a popular form and one of the uh, early and very famous architects associated with it was called Frank Lloyd Wright. And this is his own house from Oak Park in Chicago. Um, and as with some of the other examples we've seen, this is superficially a kind of neo-vernacular house. But as with the others, the primary forms are emphasised. That uh, triangular gable we can see as a complete shape and the way that horizontal elements below it seem to detach and flow past is very much like some of the work at, that done by Voise and by Macintosh. However, Wright manages to push this sense of abstraction much further than his uh, predecessors in England and Scotland. This is Oak Park, the Dana House, 
And what we can see here is that uh, the, the references to uh, vernacular, to traditional uh, forms are really starting to disappear. And there's a growing emphasis on the horizontal. The uh, masonry uh, picked out in these different colors uh, with the roof elements, uh, with the green tiles, serve to make the building look very low and and wide. And then Frank Lloyd Wright created the Roby House also in Oak Park, which is a suburb of Chicago. This building became known as, as one of the key examples of what was the what became the prairie style. Frank Lloyd Wright said that it was a response to the the wide horizons of the, the Great Plains. Um, and again, superficially, it could be argued that this is a development of some of his earlier forms. But what happens here is something that, that tips over and becomes something completely new. The strong horizontals from the Dana House are here, but uh, the overall composition, everything has become incredibly extended and flattened so that the roof overhangs that create shaded uh, terraces, the uh, use of uh, uh, very small windows with, with repetitive mullions uh, along there uh, actually starts to completely undermine the notion of this as an, a traditional building. The plan shows uh, to Europeanize a, a very innovative layout with uh, a completely open plan. There are no doors between the, the primary spaces uh, on the ground level and everything sort of wheels around that central fireplace with the staircase wrapping around it. As we saw before, this is partly uh, a typical American form having the uh, stair and services centrally placed. But nevertheless, this is new because none of the spaces are rooms contained by hallways or doors. And the, the, the way the spaces interpenetrate, that they flow together, not just within the house, but also outside. This is a view of the main living space. And we can see that fireplace centrally. The staircase goes up behind it. And we can see that there is a complete integration of uh, the structural system, of lighting, of ventilation, and of a decorative scheme, which bears no relationship whatsoever to any kind of traditional or historical precedent. This is a, a completely novel and uh, new approach to buildings. This view from the street shows just how different this building is. And at the beginning of the 20th century, this must have been uh, incredibly new, even shocking. The horizontal emphasis is relentless. Um, the heavy projecting um, stone uh, uh, cappings to the parapet walls, the overhanging eaves, which are very flat with the soffits there. Even the bricks are uh, thinner than usual. And the uh, vertical joints are pointed up flush, whereas the horizontal joints are struck, recessed, so that this horizon horizontal emphasis is very, very strong. With this building, Frank Lloyd Wright has created a completely new architectural world.